Hello, there we go. Good to see everybody today. A couple of quick um, announcements Paul mentioned in his prayer. Our Connect groups are kicking off tonight. Um, if you haven't signed up for them, you still can. Uh, just see one of the elders, see me, see Jack, see Jared. If you're not in a group and you want to be in one, and we'll point you in the right direction. We've got them meeting at different times, different places all over. Also wanted to commend you. Um, our Walk for Water was yesterday. Um, our total right now is a little over $20,000 that we've raised towards building wells. Um, I will tell you this, it's not over, although we walked yesterday. Um, our actual fund site will be open probably for another month. So if you haven't contributed to Walk for Water and you want to, I will say this, tag it on your, on your Facebook page, leave it up so people can, can go to our uh, to go to our page at Walk for Water and still give. Uh, right now, we've, we've raised enough to build another three wells. Um, I wish we could build another six or 60. Uh, but nonetheless, that's still out there. You'd be commended for that. Okay, um, we are in the middle of our series, our theme for the year, which is Upward, Inward, Outward. You saw that with the kids. You're going to be reminded of that often. We started off in January talking about how we have to... Uh, Turn our thing on before anything will work. There we go. We start off talking about how first, in order to set the stage for everything we do, we love God. We love God with all of our heart. We love God with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we spent a month talking about what that looked like practically for us. And then we moved on from there to talk about how not only do we need to love God, but within his command, that greatest command that we just sung... Uh, in order to love others, he says, as yourself. So we spent a time, some time talking about how we love ourselves, how we love me. And, and that's crucial. It's crucial because in order for us to do the next thing that God's going to ask us to do, we have to have a love for ourselves, uh, which is our ability then to love others. And our love for others stems and, and grows out of our love for God, but it also grows out of our love for ourselves. Okay, um, And you know where we're coming from. We're coming from the passage we just sing. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus gets asked a, a, a question uh, from a teacher of the law who says, What is the greatest command? Uh, well, you just sung it, but, but I want to take us back to it, and we'll go back to it often. Matthew chapter 22, Jesus says this. He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God. Well, let's just back it up. Teacher, which is the great commandment? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second, like it, you shall love your neighbor, how? As yourself. And on these two commandments depend the law and the prophets. Okay, that's where we're coming from. Jesus says, when asked, it's really all about love. It all boils down to that. It's about loving God. It's about loving yourself. It's about loving others. But how do we go about loving others? Okay. The way God wants us to. I mean, we have Jesus' command to love, and we know we are told to love others. As a matter of fact, Jesus is going to say it a little more uh, emphatically in John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, Jesus will say, A new commandment I give to you that you, what? Love one another. Just as I have loved you, emulating Jesus' own love, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so love, it's the key. It's mentioned. It's reiterated. You know, the Beatles told us that what? Love is all you need. There you go. I'll take some of you back even further. 1966, Dion Jackson had another song out that said what? Anybody know? Love makes the world go round. You got it. You're dating yourself. Some of you know these. I'm going to take some of you way back. 1955, William Holden was in a movie, the title of which said, Love is a... Ah, y'all are old. I, I had to look that one up. I mean, love's been around, but, but the problem is... When the rubber meets the road, when we get right down to it, how do we truly know how to love people in such a way that they know without a shadow of a doubt that we love them? I mean, how, how, we, we can verbally assent to the fact that God needs us to love others. And we can say, yeah, I love others. But, but how do you do that in a way that they walk away going, man, I feel like I was really loved. You know, I believe in many circles, love has been 
theorized, it's been philosophized, it's been theologized so much that, that, that we, we know how to talk about it, but do we really know how to do it? When it comes to showing love towards other people, I mean, in, in theory, we say we need to love God in our life. We need the love of God in our lives, and, and when we have the love of God in our lives, then then eventually, you know, we get so full of the love of God that that it's just going to spill out onto others as, as we engage. And and there may be a little bit of truth to that, but there's also no guarantee. You know, in my experience, I've discovered uh, discovered discovered a phenomenon within the church. And, and some of you can probably attest to this, okay? Of the hundreds of Christians, maybe thousands, who are no longer a part of the Lord's church, and when you ask them and you get right down to the nitty-gritty, why, why are you no longer involved? Why are you no longer here? Very, very few of them leave the church because they have a, a doctrinal issue or they've got a theological problem. But when you get right down to it, most people leave because they don't feel loved. Or, or they've been hurt by somebody. And whoever hurt them never took the time to say, you know what? I'm sorry. Which is an act of love we'll get to. But here's the thing. I'm certain if you went up to those people, even those people who have hurt other people and hurt them in, in terrible ways, I'm sure if you went up to them and asked them, do you love God and do you love others? Their answer would all be the same. Well, of course I do. I'm a Christian. We're supposed to love God. We're supposed to love others, right? But here's the thing. Even with all of that head knowledge about love, somewhere along the way, we've kind of missed the mark in the action side of it, in the practical application of it, okay? Somehow or another, we fail to effectively demonstrate the love that we claim to have in abundance, so now I don't want to really discourage you this morning because I know with God all things are what? Possible. And I, and I think if we look at this honestly and we take a little time to, do, to dive into God's word, that we, we can leave here practically knowing how to love better. And that's what we're going to do this month. We're going to, we're going to spend some time looking at how to love others better. Just like we talked about how to love ourselves better, we also need to show how to practically show our love towards others. You know, back in 1992... Gary Chapman wrote a book, and, and many of you may have read it. If you went through marriage counseling, you probably did. But he wrote a book in 1992 called The Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read it, heard about it? Yeah, a lot of you have. Okay. In, in his book, Chapman identifies five, five ways that we express love. Now, his, his book's a marriage book, all right? This, this, is, a, this is a book for, for married couples, and, and that was his intent, his intent was to create a book that, that could be used in counseling and whatnot. But he identifies these five ways within a marital relationship that you can show love or that people have a need to have love, love shown to them by. Okay, and, and his five languages are this. There's words of affirmation. And, and you may have gone through these little exercises to figure out which need is yours or not. There's words of affirmation. There's, there's quality time. Okay, There's receiving gifts. Kind of like that one. In case y'all are ever wondering how to express your love, gifts always work. No, I'm kidding. Not really. Um, acts of service is another one. And then lastly, physical touch. Now, we're not going to hit all of these, but I got to thinking about this. Gary wrote this book in relationship to husbands and wives, recognizing that people have different needs in how love is expressed to them. Okay? Meaning, meaning my wife may, may need words of affirmation, I may need acts of service, but you identify what that need is and then you express your love in that way so they can know without a shadow of a doubt that you're expressing love toward them. But I got to thinking about it. If this works between a husband and a wife, shouldn't it also work with everybody? I mean, don't we all have these needs to have love expressed to us? I mean, and when it comes right down to it, that's how we show each other that we really love, okay? So we're going we're gonna to work through these in this month. Not all of them, but, but we're going we're gonna to highlight a few that I think biblically really back up how Jesus calls us to emulate and model love towards others. But before we get to that, by way of introduction today, we have to define and really get our heads around what is meant by others. Okay? We got to understand this. 
We've got to know who Jesus is talking about, who we're going to express our love to in the form of these languages. Now, most of the time, if I was going to answer this question, who's my neighbor, who are these others, I'd probably take you to Luke chapter 10, where Jesus is asked by a Pharisee in that, in that instance, who is my neighbor? And we all remember his answer. That's where we get the parable of the good Samaritan, right. And so Jesus uses this parable to teach us who those others are, who that neighbor is. But we just went there not too long ago, so I'm going to take you a completely different route today. You can go read the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 if you want. I want us to go to Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, and I want us to... Uh, First, take off in verse 43. And it may sound like an obscure verse, but just hang with me. All right? Jesus is, is preaching his Sermon on the Mount, his longest theological discourse that we have. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, he says this. You've heard that it was said. In other words, you've been taught. Okay? He, he's going to make that statement over and over again. You've heard that it was said. He's basically saying, your understanding of, of what you're supposed to do is this, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, okay? Jesus is going to address this. Now, as I read this verse, I, I need you to kind of just glance back at chapter 5 as you're looking at this verse in your Bible. I want to point something out. Jesus makes six references in chapter 5. And he makes six different references to laws or customs of the Jewish society that are going on in that day. Okay, And Jesus addresses each one of them. The first is, is do not kill in verse 21. right? And he follows that up with don't be angry. Okay, He talks about adultery in verse 27. He talks about divorce in verse 31. He talks about laws concerning oaths down in verse 33. In verse 38, he talks about their custom of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And then in verse 43, he gives us this, this tidbit of love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay, So he's working through their understanding of the Old Testament law as it applies to them in their life. And he's correcting some of their misunderstandings about what God intended for that law. But here's what I find interesting. For the first five of those statements, okay, which, which dealt with you know, murder and divorce and adultery and oaths and those kind of things, for the first five of those statements, there are direct references in the Old Testament to a command Okay? In other words, we understand, we can go to Exodus and we can read, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. There's a thou shalt not associated with the first five that Jesus talks about, but not the sixth. Not the sixth. When you get to the sixth custom or the sixth law that they understood to be a part of their life, that, that sixth law being loving your neighbor and hating your enemy, there is not a single reference anywhere in the Old Testament that commands this. Not one. Loving our neighbors? Absolutely. But there is not an Old Testament, Old Testament command anywhere where God says, hate your enemy. Nowhere. What that says to me is this concept of hating your enemy, hating those who are opposed to you, did not originate with God. It originated with man. And it had happened so often that by the time Jesus addresses it in the first century, it had become customary to hate. And so the Jews hated anybody who wasn't a Jew, and they felt spiritual doing it. And this is completely contrary to what God says. Okay? Look at, we'll follow on, verse 44. Let's pick it up there. Okay? Starting Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is going to explain himself here, and he's going to give us some direction as not only these others, but, but our love as well. Okay? Starting in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 44. But I say to you, this is Jesus... Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the, his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. Jesus is calling us to a higher degree of love than what these folks had originally thought. You know, it's easy to love those who, who go to church with you. It's easy to love those who, who dress the way you dress, who think the way you do, who eat and worship the way you do, who always agree with you and who believe the way you do. If you can find that person, man, they're easy to love, right? But Jesus says, you know what? There's no reward for that. Everybody does that. Even the Gentiles do that, right? But here's the problem. What happens when we encounter somebody who doesn't think like we think, maybe who doesn't eat like we eat or drink like we drink or worship like we worship or talk like we talk or dress like we dress or think like we think or believe what we believe? What do we typically do when we encounter people like that? At best, we avoid them. Oh, I know they don't think like me. I'm not going to waste my time. They, they obviously don't, don't, don't think like I think. I'm not going to engage them. It's the natural human tendency to only want to associate with those who are like us and to avoid sometimes even discriminate against, even hate those who think, act, worship, believe differently than we do. And then as I read these words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, I see that he's calling us to a, 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 a love that is beyond what I can understand at first. Matter of fact, he, he says we need to be perfect about it. Okay? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay? Now, there are some that believe and have taught for years that Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount is giving us a standard by which there is no way we can get to. Thus the need for grace. This is what Calvin thought, matter of fact. He thought, he thought the entire Sermon on the Mount was a, was a, was a standard that, that no one could attain. And the only way we could do, the, the only thing we had left to do was to, was to rely on the grace of Jesus Christ. Which in some regards is true. Can we, can we completely do God's will perfectly? No, we can't. Okay? But when it comes to love, I, I think we, we, we kind of give ourselves a cop out and we say, well, I'm not perfect like God is perfect. So therefore I can't love like God perfectly loves. So I don't have to love you. But the problem with that is if you start thinking about it, he says, I want you to do this so you'll be children and sons of God. And, and, and I can make myself really worried about the fact that, you know what? I got a lot of trouble fully loving people like God loves. But then I got to thinking about it. Okay, And I understand that I'm an American who speaks English, and I'm not an Israeli who was being recorded in Greek. Okay, And there's a difference in that perfect word there that I think we need to get our heads around this morning, especially when it relates to loving others. Okay, Because in the English, we, we, we hear this word perfect, and, and automatically we think it means what? Flawless. Beyond reproach, beyond improvement. In other words, it's completely perfect. There's nothing lacking. And then I look at myself and I know, you know what? I'm none of those words. I'm not flawless. I'm not beyond reproach. I'm not beyond improvement. So therefore, I can't be perfect and I can't love perfectly as I define it in the English. However, in the Greek, perfect doesn't mean that. Perfect means complete, whole, all-encompassing. Now, that's a huge difference when you think about it as it relates to love. What Jesus is saying here is not you have to be God. What he's saying is the love you show needs to encompass all. Is that something we can do? Sure it is. You bet it is. But we got to get ourselves out of the way in order to do it. Okay, because when we see differences in others, we automatically create barriers that keep us from loving all. Okay, the kind of love that Jesus is calling us to is the same love that God has for each one of us. 
And it's a love not based on what we do or how we look or what we wear or what we eat or, or, or even what we believe. It's a love based upon who we are. Not on what others do or what others believe. And we have to become people who love people because of who they are, not because of what they do or haven't done. Or how they look or don't look. Or even what they believe or don't believe. Okay? Hang with me here. But in order for us to understand and in order for us to love as God loves us, we have to understand who we are in relationship to God. And we've got to answer the question, why does God love me? Is it because I'm perfect? <laughs> Quick, you can say, no, it's all right. <laughs> he doesn't love us because we're perfect. He doesn't love us because we're righteous. He doesn't love us. So why does he love us so much? I want to take you all the way back to the book of beginnings, which is Genesis, by the way. If you've got your Bibles, go back to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to go to the creation account real quick. Okay? Creation account. I love this. Then God said, let us. Trinitarian nature of God here. Let us make man. How? In our image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them and God blessed them. Now, jump to chapter 2, verse 7. It says this, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. I love this picture. God speaks creation into existence. He speaks the world into existence. And then God stoops down, gets his hands dirty, digs in the dirt a little bit and makes man. But in this, in the very first and second chapter of Genesis, we get the relationship between God and man somewhat defined. Okay. He says, let us make man how in our image. This is in Latin, the Imago Dei. This is the image of God. God created every human being that has ever been created to encapsulate the image of God within them. Every person on the planet that has ever lived or will ever live possesses the Imago Dei, the image of God within them. We all, by our very existence, have a piece of God in us. And he loves us not because of what we do, but because of who we are. Children of the Almighty God. You know, I can remember when uh, we were expecting our, our first son, Colby. Uh, he was on the way. And I, I was young and dumb. And, and back then, if you wanted information, you actually had to go get a book. Okay? Um, they're, they're like things with paper in the middle of them and... Um, it, it, because I'm going to date myself here. This was before we had the internet. So if you had to know anything, you had to go get a book. And, and I remember the book I went out and got, and some of you may have read it. What to expect when you're expecting. Anybody read it? All those, yeah, all you old folks who were alive and birthing before, uh, before the internet existed, right? And, and so, because I, I wanted to know, Right. And so I get this book and I start looking at the pictures and it starts telling me, you know, when your baby's born, his skin's going to be really wrinkled and, and he's probably going to have a cone head and he's going to have this slimy, bloody film all over him. And I'm like, oh, my. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, armed with that realism that I had seen in that book, right? We go to the hospital, and you can imagine I'm excited, and, 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 and then Colby's born, my first. And here's the thing. Yeah, his skin was, was really wrinkled, and, and, and he looked like Dan Aykroyd or Jane Curtin getting ready to do a skit on Saturday Night Live. Um, Y'all didn't get that? <laughs> Coneheads, yeah, you remember <laughs> He had a huge going ahead, right? And, and, and yeah, he was slimy and he was buddy. But, I, but I'll tell you this. In that, in that moment, he was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And I had a love for him that, that I couldn't express. Because he was mine. 
He was mine. Church, why is it that a parent can love their newborn so much? It's because when they see them, they see parts of themselves in them. What, what do you do when you see a baby for the first time? Oh, it's got its mama's nose. Luckily, not daddy's. <laughs> um, it's got his mama's chin, or it's got his daddy's eyes, or, or we see parts of ourself in that baby, and that creates a bond, a love that cannot be diminished. And in the same way, God himself loves us because of that bond which we have to him as his children by creation. God has placed within us his imago Dei, his image inside of us, so that when he sees us, he loves us, not because of what we do, not because of what we've done, but because of who we are, a child of his. But the problem is that bond isn't what it used to be, and it's been severed by sin. And even though we are children of God and bearers of his image, that image has been blurred by our sin and our, and our selfishness. But, but God... In order to restore that, as they all talked about this morning, to repair that bond, God sent his own son. And he sent his own son bearing the, the, the fullness of the Imago Dei. When, when we see Jesus, we see a, a, a complete representation of the image of God in Jesus. Okay? And Jesus came and lived and he died so that he could restore that image that we have within us of the image of God. He cleans it, as Dell talked about this morning. He, 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 he makes it clear for us to see. But that image is there. And he does it because he loves us, not because of anything we have done. Romans 5.8 tells us, but God shows, demonstrates, proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul tells us that God demonstrated or showed or proved his love while we were separated, while we were disconnected, while the image of God in, in us was blurred, Christ still died for us. Not because we cleaned ourselves up, but because he wanted to clean us up. We're told in Ephesians 1, Jared touched on this, I, I, I was on a Wednesday night, I think. Ephesians 1, he chose us in him, in Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Because of Jesus, we are once again in a position to be reconnected to our Father, to have his image fully restored in us. And this opportunity is granted to everyone who has ever been created. Everyone. It's not limited to us. The people you see in the world that you think, oh, they obviously don't believe in God. They may not believe in God, but they have the image of God in them. They might not believe what we believe theologically, but they still have the image of God in them. They may not dress like us, eat like us, walk like us, talk like us, look like us, but they still possess the image of God. And so when Jesus comes to the point where he says, you need to love others perfectly, he's saying you need to love all. All. Now, here's the fact. When you're considering who those others are, we need to get to the point where we recognize this. We are all bearers of the image of the Almighty God, the Imago Dei. The, 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 the waiter you will see at, at lunch today, the guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the gas station that you're going to go pay for your gas, the guy that delivers your mail, the people at work, the people at school, People you come in contact every single day are bearers of the Imago Dei, the image of God. Do you see the Imago Dei in others? Now, some of, their, some of that image is blurred because of sin. I recognize that. But we, as children of God, bearing the image of God, also understand the remedy for that blurred image. And the remedy for that blurred image is a relationship with Jesus Christ. But we have to see other people, even those who are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, even those who defame the name of Jesus Christ, even those who directly say, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in Jesus. You know what? They still possess the image of God. And if they 
And if God loves those with him, his image, guess what? So should we. So should we. I guess don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Okay? Right? I'm not saying throw the Bible out the world. I'm not saying throw, take the Bible and throw it away. That's not what I'm talking about. Because God's word and what we believe about it, what we believe about the gospel, what we believe about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is what we take to those people that we love to correct the image of God within them. That's why evangelism is so important. It's not just a willy-nilly step back and go say, okay, God loves everybody so everybody can do what they want. That's not what we're saying. But because God loves everybody, I'm going to take the message of his son and his message of grace, and his message of mercy, and his message of forgiveness to everyone. And there's no one I'm going to avoid simply because they don't look, act, dress, think, or believe like me. They are valuable because they possess the image of God. That's who the others are. And understand, folks, we were all those others at some point. <laughs> Every single one of us. So my question for you this morning is, do you see the image of God in all? And if you do, do you love all? And if you don't, why not? Maybe today. You've been presented with something that maybe challenged you and you said, you know what, I, I, I've got a difficult time loving all. Because let's just get real, let's just get real. <laughs> Not all come across as very lovable. <laughs> Some people are just downright hard to love, right? <laughs> That's it. They are not easy. And, and you know what? Jesus says, I want you to love like I love. And I think back to the cross. And I think about the guy who was a Roman and a pagan who didn't believe in God. Not at least not Jesus' as God. It was probably cursed. It was probably laughing. As he took a spike and he drove it through the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said what? Father, forgive him. And then I think of the ways I've been wronged. Or the ways I've been hurt. The ways I justify myself in, in lashing out or being unkind. And then I think, you know what? It doesn't even compare. God help us to love better. God help us to love others. If you need the prayers of our shepherds this morning to love better, let us know. If you're ready, if you're ready to engage in a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, if you're ready to confess him as Lord, if you're ready to, to be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins, that's ready for you as well. But I want us to walk out of here today with a different attitude about who we're going to love. And the answer to that is who? Everybody. If we can help you with anything, let us know as we stand, as we sing.